The Clash formed in London in 1976, and their ideal incarnation, Joe Strummer, Mick Jones, Paul Simonon, and Topper Heaton, would only last five years. During that time, they would release 17 singles and four albums. The Clash were smack in the center of the London punk scene, but they carved out a spot for themselves that was unique, and somehow, they seemed a bit above the fray. Even as they folded in reggae and ska elements, funk, R&B, rockabilly, and jazz, they remained authentic while they made massive, enduring hits that continue to appeal to millions of people across the world. So how did such an incredible band seemingly self-destruct just at the peak of their powers? And who was truly to blame for the disintegration of the band? This is the story of The Clash and the man who made and broke them. Joe Strummer was born John Meller in Ankara, Turkey, August 1952. He was born outside England because his father worked in the Foreign Office, a staid and conservative organization. His parents were middle class, which would be a bit of a conflict with Joe Strummer's eventual and full-throated embrace of a working class perspective. But as a child of a father in the foreign service, young John's upbringing brought him to many exotic lands and exposed him to a wide swath of cultural experiences. In Mexico, I even went to Spanish-speaking school two years. In every situation, we were freaks. I'd had an eye and ear full of some very strange places. I saw some very weird things as a child. When John was eight, his dad's work brought him and the family back to the UK and they took up residence in a modest home in Warlingham, a far suburb of London. When the Shah of Iran was deposed, John's father was called off to work in Iran. John and his brother David found themselves at a boarding school, London's Freeman School, which housed roughly 50 boys and 50 girls. They lived there for the next nine years, during which time the boys would see their parents once or twice a year. They embraced their independence as well as they could, enduring hazing and ongoing emotional neglect, which had to have a deep impact on two young boys. John ended up pretending their parents did not exist. At the age of nine, he tried unsuccessfully to run away from the school with an older student. John fought his battles and stood up for himself with a sharp sense of humor and a taste for practical jokes. He wrote poetry, drew cartoons, and handmade his own Christmas cards. John also delved into theater and cinema. The 1962 silver screen epic Lawrence of Arabia had a profound impact on John. He devoured all the books of E.E. E. Lawrence. As time went by, he became popular among the students, even though he stood out as from a lower social rung than most of the other posh, wealthy classmates. John's brother, David, by contrast, became more quiet and drew into himself in a world of books. In his early years at boarding school, young John was transformed when he discovered rock and roll music. Specifically, at age 11 in 1964, he heard the Rolling Stones not fade away in the rec room on the radio. I was at a really brutal boarding school where they filled you with crap, and it sounded like the road to freedom. Live, enjoy life, fuck chartered accountancy. Dylan, the Beach Boys, the Kinks, the Who, Hendrix, the Stones, and more were studied very closely by John. Each riff was memorized, each groove was internalized. He mail-ordered records from black blues and rock and roll icons like Bo Diddley, John Lee Hooker, and Elmore James. In 1965, he picked up a Chuck Berry record containing the hit single Rock and Roll Music. He already knew the track from the Beatles for Sale LP, and learning its true origin was eye-opening. Abandoned by his parents and stuck at this harsh boarding school, John already had the blues. And so as he delved deeper, blues music really meant something to him. In 1968, suddenly it seemed like revolution was filling the streets. John watched on the dorm TV as the year of the barricades unfolded with student protests, sit-ins, and even riots. The whole world was exploding. Soon, John was growing his hair long and transforming into a hippie. Seeing communists, anarchists, and other leftists clashing with the cops on TV was thrilling, and he desperately wanted to join them. He felt a revolution was happening just up the road in London, and he was stuck at school, missing it. Another aspect of John's hippiedom was some experimentation with mind-altering substances. He heard that John Lennon had eaten the filter from a benzo inhaler, so he did it too. What followed was a harrowing 72-hour trip 
He also started jamming with some of his classmates in the rec room, Joe playing acoustic guitar. An amateur band would eventually rise from these sessions, the Burger Masters. Andy Ward was on drums and would later go on to play in the prog rock band Camel. John became obsessed with the Captain Beefheart album Trout Mask Replica. He ventured out from school for some gigs. Canned Heat and then Mott the Hoople were among the first shows he saw. But the guitar he owned, a gift from a cousin which had once been played by Pete Townsend, sat unused. John didn't think he could play music. I thought only mythical beings could play music. John became popular with his classmates and with girls. He was becoming embroiled in the world of sex, drugs, and rock and roll and drifting away from his slightly posher middle-class roots. His civil servant father, Ronald Meller, was awarded an MBE by the Queen in 1969, the same year John Lennon returned his MBE as a political statement. John's parents returned to Surrey to settle down permanently, and John moved in with them when he finally graduated from London's Freeman School in 1970. For a young man deeply steeped in rock and rebellion, it was a shocking and disorienting experience. In the fine tradition of English rock stars since the Beatles, John applied to art schools in London and was accepted to the Central School of Art in Southampton Row. Kit Buckler was another art student at the nearby Camberwell College of Art. John and Kit both took rooms at the same dusty Victorian boarding house, and they were both into blues music. Kit was from the rougher side of working-class London. They were living in the area that was the swinging London of the 1960s. John basked in what once was there and had trouble processing the fact that he seemed to have missed the boat. The Beatles had split, Brian Jones was dead, and Hendrix had just died earlier that month. By the time I reached London, the whole thing was over. I never did get to see the Stones, the Beatles, the Kinks, the Yardbirds. Inspired by the folk legend Woody Guthrie, John Meller started calling himself Woody Meller. And like Bob Dylan, another Woody Guthrie acolyte, Woody Meller began concocting a hazy, vague past for himself. Something that would become even more pronounced when the clash formed and he became Joe Strummer. But while he hadn't fully thrown himself into music yet, he acted like a rock star, gradually reinventing himself, acting somewhat crazy, and speaking with a more American inflection perhaps inspired by the beat poets and authors he idolized. But two months before John started art school, his brother, David Meller, the quiet kid, stressed by his daunting pre-med workload and personal demons, ended his own life. Woody somewhat romanticized his brother's death, something which must have been devastating for his family. Rather than drawing closer, he drew apart from his parents. It could be said that he escaped into his new persona, but that's probably an oversimplification. Regardless, he was changing. Another resident of his shared home was to have a huge impact on Woody Meller. It was Tymon Dog. Tymon was a 20-year-old musician who had scored a record deal at 17 by sending a demo to Pi Records. The record that arose from that deal was a single called Bitter Thoughts of Little Jane, and it failed to chart, but it caught the ear of Paul McCartney. Tymon ended up on Apple Records, where the label tried to fashion him into a heartthrob pop star. He worked on a record for a year at Apple, but even the encouragement of George Martin and Paul McCartney didn't seem to help. His record never came to fruition and the project was scrapped. He was then signed to the Moody Blues Threshold Records. The resulting single there was called And Now She Says She's Young and it was getting some radio play by late 1970. Tymon fled the modest spotlight by hanging out with Woody and his friends at Vomit Heights. That was the official nickname for the house they lived in. Among the young hipsters at Vomit Heights, a love of music was the common thread holding all of them together. Many of them could play, but Woody was still a musician only in his wildest dreams. But those dreams started seeming more and more attainable. One day, Tymon brought Woody Mellor with him busking. Tymon would play and sing, and Woody would hold the hat. During slow moments, Tymon would show Woody simple songs on guitar. Stuff by the Beatles, the Stones, Chuck Berry, and of course, Woody Guthrie. Soon, Woody bought a ukulele for a pound and 99p, figuring that less strings would be easier to handle. He was still self-conscious, and he didn't consider himself a real musician. I spent the greater part of my youth listening to music. It all seemed so complex at the time. It was the years of great guitarists like Hendrix and Clapton, and it all seemed so unobtainable, really, if you were a slow starter like I was. That summer, Meller quit art school, got a seasonal job at a rural farm outside of London to, quote, get his head together. And then he moved back to London and rented a squalid flat on Ridley Road in Harleston with, with Tymon and like 10 other bohemian pals. 
Woody started busking in subwaves. He performed for commuters, for drunks heading home from a night out. He developed a unique style. Joe Strummer was a lefty, but he held the guitar the abnormal way around, so his dominant hand was his strumming hand instead of his fretting hand. He learned Heartbreak Hotel, Not Fade Away, and other sentimental rock classics. He nurtured a growing collection of Bo Diddley records, which he studied closely. His favorites, Mona and Don't Let It Go, were songs he would incorporate into sets for years to come. Bo Diddley was Joe Strummer's guitar hero. In 1972, Joe's busking career was curtailed. Joe later claimed it was due to the landlord learning a black guy was living there. I arrived at the flat and there was this police car outside and all our stuff was being thrown out the window. Me and Timon had found this black guy in the park who had given us a fright and being hippies we invited him back to our place to live. And soon the landlord found out there's a black guy living at the house and a gang of toughs rushed in and beat up everybody and slung them all out. The landlord bunged the cops a few quid and it was then I started learning what justice was and wasn't. Some friends Woody had were forming a band that would eventually become the Vultures. Offering the use of his drums to the band's drumless drummer ensured his admission to the rock band as a new singer. The Vultures' first gig was in 1973 at the Students' Union Bar. They played rock and roll oldies, classic country, and Who and Kinks covers. It was the first time the artist who would become Joe Strummer ever played with a band on a proper stage. The Vultures booked six more gigs at the same place, with Woody getting better and better. His singing wasn't great, but his on-stage charisma always carried the performance. The Vultures only lasted for a handful of shows once they left the safety of the college campus, but their legendary last show at the Granary in Bristol would be noted as the one where Woody's rock persona would be born. The show was plagued by technical issues, but Woody somehow tapped into an energy that he used to adeptly control the audience. However, the Vultures still broke up and Woody found himself without a band. He took a job as a maintainer of graves at the local boneyard. Too weak and skinny to dig graves, Woody mostly cleaned up dead flowers and detras from the graves. He was depressed and plagued by self-doubt. And then Woody Mellor had a breakthrough of sorts. He wrote and recorded a couple of original songs, including Crum Bum Blues, which contained elements that hinted at future Clash songs. He went on a busking road trip with Timon, playing music on the road like his heroes, avoiding the cops. The experience reinvigorated his spirits and he returned to London ready. Woody took a spare room in a house in Maida at 101 Walterton Road. He was living only a few hundred yards away from the council tower block called Wilmcote House. It was the home of young Mick Jones, and it would later inspire the Clash song, London's Burning. Mick was sort of the opposite of Joe Strummer in some ways. Joe was raised in a middle-class household and he romanticized the rough life of a struggling artist. Mick Jones, on the other hand, was born into a rough life and romanticized the glamorous life of a wealthy, successful artist. June 26, 1955. Mick Jones was born to a Russian Jewish mother and a Londoner who was originally from Wales. They lived in a flat in South London before moving to the council block of Christchurch on Brixton Hill. It was a diverse community, and Mick grew up around a lot of immigrants. There was a thriving West Indian community. But at the age of eight, Mick's life was disrupted when his parents split acrimoniously. His dad moved out and his mom moved to America. Mick was left in the care of his grandmother. He was into football and footballers, collecting their autographs. He read comic books preferably war and Marvel comics. His mother sent him American comics, which made him interested in the far-off world of the USA. And when he was 12, he started buying records. Mick's first two album purchases were Cream's Disraeli Gears and Hendrix's Smash Hits collection, followed by records by The Beatles, The Stones, and The Kinks. He studied the albums and poured over the album covers. In 1968, he went to his first concert, a free show in Hyde Park featuring The Nice, Traffic, Junior's Eyes, and The Pretty Things. At this moment, Mick Jones knew he wanted to be a rock star. Once I discovered music and realized I didn't want to be a footballer anymore, that was it. It was rock and roll or nothing. I never wanted a proper job. That wasn't an option. Mick soon ended up at a staid, uptight boarding school, not unlike the one Woody, a.k.a. Joe Strummer, went to. He was one of the school rebels, spending much of his time with his buddy, Robin Banks. Mick and Robin's friendship was solidified when they got into a literal fistfight over who was better, Chuck Berry or Bo Diddley. 
My method of rebellion was to be as disruptive as possible. Mix was to have the longest hair and the tightest trousers in the school, which was really quite shocking because it was a very conservative institution. Robin and Mick spent Sundays dropping acid and watching shows at the Implosion Club and the Roundhouse, groups like Tyrannosaurus Rex and Pink Floyd. In the summer of 69, the pair experienced Led Zeppelin's first big show at the Royal Albert Hall. A month later, they saw the Rolling Stones play for free in Hyde Park, a show that took place two days after the tragic death of Brian Jones. Mick can even be seen in some crowd shots of the show. He became obsessed with the Stones just as they hit a career high. Let It Bleed, Beggar's Banquet, Sticky Fingers, Exile on Main Street. Their latest album would come out on a Thursday, and by Friday, we knew it inside out. Likewise, Mick and Friends adopted a rakish outlaw pose and attitude reminiscent of the Stones, particularly Keefe. In the early 70s, Jones got into glam bands and their aesthetic. Meanwhile, his grandma moved to a posh apartment to be closer to her sister. The young rebel found himself growing his hair long and wearing tight trousers in the company of a gaggle of doting old ladies. He and Robin became more into glam bands like Slade, Small Faces, and Mott the Hoople. They would swipe glam clothes from the fancy shops. Mick hung out with older students who had a band called Schoolgirl. With this new gang, he'd travel anywhere he could to see Mott the Hoople. The band themselves started calling their group the Mott's Lot, and their manager would let the boys in the stage door to see the shows for free. The lead singer of Schoolgirl was often asked on stage to provide a vocal during Mott encores. The experience of being so close to a huge, successful band had a huge impact on Mick. Fame seemed actually possible. And so, like Joe Strummer, Mick Jones grew up with one foot in middle-class England and one in working-class England. He started poor but he was ready for the life of a glamorous glam rock star. Joe, a.k.a. Woody, started as a posh middle-class kid and grew to idealize and identify with the struggles of the working class. Also like Joe, Mick adopted the pose before he picked up an instrument. Schoolgirl never graduated beyond a handful of pub gigs in 72, but they inspired Mick to pick up a used Hofner guitar for the handsome sum of 16 pounds. Robin tuned the guitar for him and taught him a few chords. The first song Mick Jones learned to play was Spoonful by Cream. When Schoolgirl broke up in 1972, singer John Brown and Mick decided to form a band. They named it The Delinquents. Like Joe, Mick went to art school. To the boys, English art school seemed like the great incubator of rock bands, but in reality, the times were changing and The Clash were perhaps the last great rock band to emerge from the UK art school system. Mick's mom would mail him copies of Cream and Rock Scene magazines, which were unavailable in England. Robin Banks was soon to live up to his pseudonym. He got caught up with a rough bunch and was nabbed by the cops when the group was caught robbing a betting parlor. Robin ended up in the maximum security Albany prison on the Isle of Wight for two years. At 19, he was the youngest prisoner there. This would be the subject of the Clash song, Stay Free. In September of 72, Mick started at Hammersmith College of Art and continued to pursue his rock dreams with the delinquents, but without the support of his friend, Robin Banks. When the New York Dolls appeared on the Old Grey Whistle Test TV program in November of 1973, they made a splash. The band's music, look, and attitude had a huge impact on both Mick with his band The Delinquents and Woody with his band The Vultures. The Dolls impacted many of the other figures in the punk and post-punk movement that would follow. Mick was soon getting his hair curled. The Dolls had a massive impact on me. They were incredible. They blew my mind, the way they looked, the whole attitude. They didn't care about anything. They weren't great sounding by anyone's standards, but that didn't matter. Mick had been focusing on bass, but at this point he sold a stack of sci-fi comic books and invested in a black Fender Telecaster. He was becoming the star of his band, writing originals and leaning into the future, into the transition of glam into punk. Meanwhile, Woody and his vultures were covering old 60s songs, wearing jeans and white t-shirts. When the delinquents finally signed with Pie Records, things changed. First, they were persuaded to change their name to Little Queenie and fire their drummer. They were snatched away from Pie by former Mott the Hoople man manager Guy Stevens. Finally, Mick, the only band member writing original material, was fired from the band. His loud rhythm guitar quashed in favor of a hoopalesque keyboardist. Mick cried when he heard the band's first demo, and then became determined to really get good at guitar. He moved back to his grandma's house, swapped his black Fender for a Les Paul Jr., and spent hours picking out Keith Richards' guitar solo on You Can't Always Get What You Want. 
December 13, 1955, Paul Simonon was born in a rented flat in South London. He grew up around communities of first-generation black immigrants. His father had trouble holding down a job, and they moved around a lot. Brixton, Notting Hill, Ramsgate. In Brixton, they lived near the quote-unquote front line where West Indians regularly clashed with the cops. Young Paul was an artist, and he wanted to be a painter. His authoritarian father was an amateur artist, but he mocked such ambitions as a way to make a living. Gustav Simonin had been drafted in 1950 and sent to Kenya to suppress colonial uprisings there. It was a horrible and bloody chapter in British colonial history, and it appears to have had a deep effect on Paul's father. He brought Paul to the movies often, and at this point in cinema, a lot of these films glamorized war, portraying valor and heroism. The young artist absorbed a good deal of this stuff. The films would go on to inform the language and the look of his future band. Paul's parents split up a few years later and his mom's new partner brought her and her sons to Italy on an extended trip. Paul was surrounded by and absolutely adored the spaghetti westerns of Italy. Italian Beatle fan girls loved that he was British and named Paul. Without his hard-ass dad in tow, Paul and his brother basically skipped school for a year. They were surrounded by fine art, architecture, and music. But it wouldn't last. A year later, he was back in Brixton, the new kid again, and a year behind in school. By 1969, Paul had become a skinhead, a movement pushing back against the hippie ethos. The fashion was tough and streetwise, based on shaved head American GIs and astronauts, influenced by the peg jeans and short sleeves of Jamaican rude boys. The music these young skinheads listened to was almost exclusively reggae, ska, and rock steady. Over time, the movement became associated with violence and then racism. Paul got caught up in violence against his will more than once, attacked by other skinheads, but he abhorred the racism. And in 1970, he was sent to live with his dad on Faraday Road in West London. It was once a high-end Victorian neighborhood. Now these fine houses had been divided into shabby flats, and now what was one of the worst streets in West London. His dad worked a stall in the market, and Paul was surrounded again by a vibrant West Indian community, and was able to sometimes sneak out and check out reggae parties with his mates, many of whom were black kids. In the process, he was picking up patois and hearing lots of classic reggae rhythms. Paul's flat was a stone's throw from the hip and happening Portobello Road, but his father, a stern taskmaster, forced Paul to do all the household chores as well as two newspaper delivery routes for money. He also sold hand-shaped candles in a stall at the market. It was hard, but it refocused Paul on his art and on his work ethic. Looking back, being with my father made me self-sufficient. It taught me how to boil an egg. It was tough, but I needed it. It taught me the value of hard work. His school, Isaac Newton, was described as a school for dummies where the teachers, quote, specialized in riot control. He was one of the few white English kids, but his art made him popular. After graduating, Paul's talents paid off. In 1972, he won a scholarship to Byam Shaw Art School on Campton Street in Nottingate. His professors gushed about American abstract art, and they didn't appreciate Paul slowly laboring away at realistic works in oils. His final work in a show of protest was an exquisitely rendered oil painting of a trash-strewn junkyard. About that time, Paul met another student, one Mick Jones, who lived just down the road. Mick was less into art and more into being a rock and roll star. For his part, Paul had only one Eddie Cochran record in his collection, and he had no idea who the New York Dolls were. Sure, he dug the Stones and the Kinks and bands like that, but he was mostly steeped in reggae. But he looked cool, and he had the right attitude. Jones and his new manager, Bernie Rhodes, thought he might be a good fit for their new project. So about Bernie Rhodes, one night Mick Jones and his buddy Tony James went out to a trashy music venue called London Rooms. The music scene in London was lame at that time and they were checking out a new band called Deaf School. And they ran into a guy named Bernie Rhodes. Mick asked him if he was a piano player because he was wearing a hat. No, but you're wearing one of my shirts, Bernie replied. He'd been designing shirts for Malcolm McLaurin's sex boutique, and Mick had one on. Once the pair told them they were forming a band called London SS, Bernie said, without ever hearing them, he would be their manager. It was punk dressed up with shocking Nazi images. The London SS band lineup was still being determined. Because London SS were managed by Rhodes, they were being introduced to others on the scene. Mick Jones and Tony James actually auditioned for the Sex Pistols in October of 1975, but fashion was king and their look was all wrong. I remember a bunch of guys with hair down their backs. They looked ridiculous and we were all laughing. 
Mick, instead of going upstairs, picked up a guitar and started jamming with us, and it would have worked except for the hair. Rhodes was an associate of Malcolm McLaurin, who was also working with the Sex Pistols. With McLaurin off in the States, Rhodes would soon discover John Lydon and hire him to sing for the Sex Pistols, forming one of the most iconic and influential bands of the era. But soon, McLaurin returned from the U.S. and reasserted control of the Sex Pistols. <laughs> Rhodes was angry. He was determined to form and manage his own group, and that's where Mick Jones and London SS came in. London SS auditioned members through 1975 and early 1976, with many members staying for one rehearsal or less. Bernie Rhodes found them a rehearsal space under a cafe called the Paddington Kitchen. Mick Jones put a poster from a Holocaust documentary on the wall. A long line of potential bandmates responded to their ad and auditioned for the band. Future Clash drummer Topper Heaton auditioned, played well and he looked the part, but he wanted to make 25 quid a week. So after a few rehearsals, he left for paying cover band gigs. Paul Simonon even accompanied a friend to an audition and he looked cool, so Mick Jones asked him to sing Roadrunner by Jonathan Richmond. He didn't know the song and he couldn't sing, so that was a disaster. Morrissey even applied. We got this letter from this bloke in Manchester called Morrissey. We thought he couldn't possibly know anything about rock and roll coming from the north, so we chucked it in the bin. The London SS name and Nazi imagery were chosen deliberately to be shocking to the older generation, but the young band members were somewhat clueless as to the true implications. Look and shock took a front seat, but Bernie Rhodes and Mick Jones are both Jewish, and when Rhodes challenged the band on the Nazi-inspired images and name, London SS band members were somewhat gobsmacked and rightfully uncomfortable. One night we were asked to meet Bernie Rhodes at the Bull and Bush pub on Shepherd Bush Green. It was a really heavy pub and very crowded. Bernie took out this bag full of SS paraphernalia, swastikas, daggers, all this stuff. He emptied it all on the table and he said, so what do you think of it? If you call yourself the London SS, this is what you're going to have to deal with. The Sex Pistols were starting to develop a following, and Malcolm McLaren came to see London SS rehearse and see if they had some promise. When McLaren declared they were going nowhere, it seemed to signal the band was done. They broke up, never having played a single show, and leaving behind only a bootleg recording of one rehearsal. Members of London SS would go on to form The Damned and Generation X. Fast forward to 2012, original London SS guitarist Eunan Brady has reformed the band. The new version of London SS are still active today. Bernie Rhodes saw potential in Mick Jones, and he stayed on as his manager. They both remembered the cocky attitude and the cool look of Paul Simonon. Bernie encouraged Mick to ditch Tony James and form a band with Paul, and so Mick reached out to Paul Simonon and asked him to learn to play an instrument. So when Paul picked up the bass, the two connected with Keith Levine on guitar and they all started rehearsing. Whoever was handy played drums. Terry Chimes joined on drums, but he quit after a few weeks. And so the new band were still in search of a lead singer and a drummer and a name. But in February of 1976, a cataclysmic event happened which would cause a shift in the direction of the new band and the punk movement in general. Meanwhile, Woody Miller was playing in the 101ers, a pub band comprised of fellow hippies who were mostly coalescing around Woody's enthusiasm. They started with one guitar amp and one speaker, and they rolled their gear to gigs in a stolen pram. Gradually, they got a few gigs, and slowly, accumulated gear. Woody got a Vox AC30 amp. They were getting pretty good at playing rudimentary 50s and 60s covers, even if Woody could barely still play guitar. And the 101ers secured a regular Wednesday night slot in an upstairs room at the Chippenham Pub. They called the room the Charlie Pig Dog Club. This regular gig was huge, building Woody's confidence in his chops as a frontman. At first, it was just friends hanging out and partying, but soon more and more punters were coming to see the 101ers perform. Woody developed his Elvis-crazed rockabilly moves, jittering leg, and his greaser style. He invested in a Fender Telecaster with 100 pounds he was paid for marrying a South African woman who wanted British citizenship. This guitar would remain with him throughout the Clash years and beyond, and was displayed at his funeral in 2002. He got a Spanish girlfriend for a time, Paloma, which was the start of his infatuation with Spain. What she thought of Joe's South African wife, I'm not sure. I have a lot of questions about that whole situation. Woody also 
renamed himself Joe Strummer, evolving in true rock and roll style. I called myself Joe Strummer because I could only play six strings, or none at all. The 101ers even got an enthusiastic write-up in Melody Maker magazine, so when the Charlie Pig Dog Club was shuttered in April of 1975, they had no trouble finding another gig. The Eldon Pub in Ladbroke Grove would become their new home, and then a venue called Windsor Castle. It was there Mick Jones and Tony James first saw the 101ers. Paul Simonon saw them there as well. First time I saw the 101ers was at this dump which had people running around with their dogs and giant hippies stomping around. He'd be playing and there'd be a woman breastfeeding a baby and dogs running across the stage, but Joe was definitely the one to watch. Soon, Joe Strummer and the 101ers were playing pubs across London and outside the city as well. They were improving, with Joe writing more songs for the set, many about cars and girls. He bought a brown zoot suit and he owned it completely. The 101ers band recorded a demo with the Feel Goods manager Vic Miley, Joe's first time in a pro studio. On January 7, 1976, Joe's 101ers were playing at Dingwalls. Joe Strummer caught the eye and ear of the fledgling Chiswick Records owner Ted Carroll. One of the two releases on Chiswick at the time was a reissue of Vince Taylor and his Playboys, Brand New Cadillac. The song would later become a clash track on the London Calling album. After a tiny show at a university, Carroll and his business partner, Roger Armstrong, were impressed with Joe's passion and energy even in front of only a dozen or so half-interested students. Carol and Armstrong approached the 101ers about recording a single, an offer they happily accepted. The group convened at Pathway Studios in Archway, and one of the songs they recorded was an early, unfinished version of the Spliff Bunker. The possible A-side from the session was a Joe Strummer original called Keys to My Heart. Joe was shy in studio, hiding behind a wall of gear to scribble lyrics. But after many live shows, the band was tight by now. They nailed their tracks in one take. But the direction the band would take was unclear. The one thing that was clear was Joe Strummer's talent and passionate energy. Other labels began approaching the 101ers to perform. They laid down some tracks at BBC Studios with Simon Jeffy. The band was torn on which of these recordings to release, but little did they know that a seismic shift was about to occur. On April 3rd and 23rd of 1976, the 101ers had shows booked at the Nashville Rooms. Those nights, a new band called the Sex Pistols was slated to open for them. They were younger, edgier, and according to the press, the Pistols had trashed the gear of another band they'd opened for. Joe had read about this in NME. Danger and chaos was in the air. When the Pistols arrived before the April 3rd show, they were accompanied by a group of fans, proto-punks called the Bromley Contingent dressed up in fully outrageous punk gear, much of it from Malcolm McLaurin and Vivian Westwood's sex clothing boutique. McLaurin was also there, ordering around the band, orchestrating their looks, their poses. Sid had on an Elvis-esque gold lame jacket. The 101ers were not that impressed with the attitudes and the posing, and the sound for the first show was not that great. But the April 23rd show is the stuff of legends. It was attended by Mick Jones, Paul Simonon, Keith Levine, and other future punk stars. A few songs in, a fistfight started among Vivian Westwood and some audience members. Malcolm McLaren and Johnny Rotten jumping into the fray without hesitation. Strummer was gobsmacked by the whole energy and attitude of both the situation and the Sex Pistols set. His musical world was turned upside down. I saw the future with a snotty handkerchief right in front of me. Five seconds into their first song, I knew we were yesterday's papers. Joe continued to play with the 101ers as he'd sunk years into the band. But his attitude had changed, and his onstage persona would soon absorb some of Johnny Rotten's energy. As audience members Mick Jones, Hall Simonon, and Keith Levine were wondering if Joe Strummer might be the new lead singer for their new band. Soon, Mick Jones and Paul Simonon were hanging out regularly at 22 Davis Road, a squat in Acton Vale, West London. Mick moved there with his new girlfriend, Viv Albertine, a later member of the Slits. It was a gathering spot for the burgeoning punk scene. John Ritchie, a.k.a. Sid Vicious, was also a regular visitor. He was a very imposing, intimidating figure. The first time I saw him, he was wearing a full-length rubber coat down to his ankles, no socks, and brothel creepers and shades, and a totally shaved head. He looked fantastic. 
Sid and Paul Simonon had a lot in common and they became fast friends, and Paul continued to learn how to play bass. We borrowed a bass from Tony James and painted the notes on the fretboard. Paul turned out to be a fantastic bass player, but it was a bit frustrating at first. Mick and Paul saw Joe around town now. They saw him at the Dole office one day in line and they sort of glared at each other. A week later, Mick and Paul were rocking on Portobello Road with Glenn Matlock and they saw Joe again. Since the Pistols and the 101ers had done gigs together, Glenn and Joe stopped to chat. Soon the group were having a pint in a pub. Joe was impressed with their gang-like image. Mick told Joe Strummer that he didn't like the 101ers, but he thought Joe himself was great. On May 25, 1976, Bernie Rhodes and Keith Levine approached Joe Strummer after a Sex Pistols show at the 100 Club. Rhodes told Strummer he was forming a band like the Sex Pistols, and he wanted to introduce Joe to the boys. And so then, on May 30th, Rhodes collared Joe after a 101 show at the Golden Lion. And Bernie informed Joe he had 48 hours to decide, was he in or out? He did this without the knowledge of the other band members. That's the kind of weird power mood that was common with Bernie Rhodes. Joe Strummer was flummoxed. The 101ers had just signed a record deal to Chiswick to release Keys to Your Heart as a single. And now this? After two years with the 101ers, he felt like things were finally taking off. That He couldn't shake the feeling that Bernie and the Pistols were on the verge of something momentous, historic even. Even though Keith Levine was the only person he even knew in this new band, he was really considering it. 24 hours after the ultimatum, Rhodes called Joe at home. He had accelerated the timeline. Forget 48 hours. Rhodes wanted an answer right now. And so, Joe Strummer broke up the 101ers. He asked Richard Dudansky, the 101ers drummer, to join him in the new band. But once Dudansky met Bernie Rhodes, it was a non-starter. Bernie was such a pushy pontificator, with this grand vision and a brusque attitude. He turned a lot of people off. Joe broke the news to the 101ers and to his record label. They still released Keys to Your Heart. Bernie Rhodes invited Joe Strummer to meet up at the pre-clash band's rehearsal location, 22 Davis Road. When Strummer showed up, Levine played Keys to Your Heart, Strummer's own song. Bernie Rhodes informed Joe that this new band was going to rival the Sex Pistols. You can't overestimate Bernie's importance. He set up the whole punk scene, basically. He saw how non-musicians like myself and John Lydon could contribute. And now the band, Bernie's Vision, needed a home. A disused former railway building, turned Ghibli's gin warehouse, had fallen into disuse and disrepair. Rhodes convinced the local council that he was turning it into a sort of music practice space for disadvantaged youth to learn how to play music. I mean, he wasn't exactly lying. Rhodes named the place Rehearsal Rehearsals. Its crumbly, musty atmosphere reminded of my grandmother's old coal cellar, and the, and the damp cold penetrated everything, even in the hot months of August. Rehearsals was a place you didn't feel you wanted to hang around any longer than you had to. Although brave attempts had been made to make it bearable, it was nevertheless a bleak and depressing environment. In May 76, a band called The Heart Drops moved in. With Joe Strummer on vocals and guitar, Mick Jones and Keith Levine on two more guitars, Paul Simonon on bass, and, well, no drummer, yet. Joe Strummer's school friend Pablo LeBritton sat in on drums during the first few rehearsals for the band, but soon LeBritton left the band and Terry Chimes gradually became their regular drummer. He really was the best drummer in their group of friends. I don't think Terry was officially hired or anything, he just had been playing with us. Future producer Mickey Foote had been working with Joe and the 101ers, and now he tagged along and joined Bernie's team at Rehearsal Rehearsals as a sound man and general cool dude. But many of the others who had been friends and collaborators with Clash band members were now left behind because Bernie didn't like the cut of their jib. The 101ers, Tony James, who would go on to form Generation X with Billy Idol, Timon, Chrissy Hind, an American singer who had sung with Mick's group once or twice when she was no longer welcome. She would go on to sing with the Pretenders. Bernie separated people. There was a process of pulling people away from where they were and from their friends. While Mick, Paul, and Terry were rough-edged London youths, Joe was older and a bit more established as a musician and a personality. To fit into the group, he had to toughen up a bit, work on his pose and his delivery. Image was key. And if any of his friends called him Woody, he got angry. He was no longer Woody, the aged hippie type. He was Joe Strummer, a street tough with a deepening Cockney accent and a roughed-up attitude. And a lot of that was due to Bernie's vision for this new band. 
So they decorated the place and they settled in. Terry moved his drum kit into rehearsal rehearsals and Paul, the resident artist, painted a mural on the wall, inspired by his junkyard painting from art school. And with Bernie Rhodes spurring them forward, cajoling them, shaping their image and their very perspective on the musical revolution of punk rock, the group rehearsed furiously seven days a week. Every one of them was focused and determined. They had a vision, or rather they were following along with Bernie's vision, and it was becoming their vision as well. They were committed. A huge part of this was the band's name, and it took a while for something to stick. They were the Weak Heart Drops, a, a lyric by the reggae group Big Youth, which was then shortened to simply the Heart Drops, and they were also the Mirrors and the Phones and the Psychotic Negatives. They were the Outsiders until they discovered there was another band called the Outsiders, and they were finally the Clash, named so by Paul Simonon, who saw the word pop up repeatedly in news stories in the Evening Standard. It was an apt description of socio-political strife and musical dissonance.